Okay, so welcome to week three, uh, section two, and uh, today is uh, Saturday, uh, 27th of February. Okay, uh, before we start, what I'll do, if you have gone through the video, can you see the uh, uh, slide? Uh, sorry, the yeah, text file? Yes. Yes, sir. It's yes, sir. Okay, so uh, do you see the text file only yes, or sir, also the background of my window? What do you see? Only the text file or, or, or the desktop as well? Sir, just the text file. Sir, just just the text, text file, sir. Okay, just lovely. text file. So basically, if you've gone through the video lecture, then um, uh, this uh, today's we, uh, uh, discussion is divided into four parts. Topic one, we will be discussing these four things. Topic two, we'll be discussing these two things. In, uh, topic three is basically high school math mathematics, how to read a graph, etc. And topic four is uh, using those uh, things in the context of some economics concepts. And finally, uh, we look at uh, opportunity cost again. Uh, but, uh, we've done this last week, so I don't think we need to cover it that much. And finally, we'll look at marginal decisions. Okay, so now let me stop share and let's go to the slides. Let me stop share. Okay, so uh, week three is uh, thinking like an economist, and our reference is still against Stiglitz and Walsh. Uh, and uh, the thing uh, we've already discussed this in the last uh, week that uh, how does an economics think? That is, we're lo just looking at how decisions are made, mainly by firms, but also by households. Okay, and then we, sa we said that decisions have four components. Number one, there's a trade-off because of scarcity. Number two, uh, we have to look at the incentives. What were the incentives related to? The incentives were related to the environment. Again, we are repeating one term again and again, the environment under which the decision maker finds themselves in. Then we looked at exchange. A certain good or service is going to pass from the buyer to the seller. So this exchange has to be mutually beneficial for both parties at the same time. We discussed this. And the fifth one, the distribution one, according to our text, we don't need it, so we don't need to do it. Our analytical tool will be markets. Why do we uh, discuss markets? Because markets is an institutional arrangement where large scale cooperation for resource allocation is possible, number one. Number two, this resource allocation can be performed with no or minimum central coordination. That means somebody else externally like the government, or for example, in your case, maybe your program director, the uh, so dean of your uh, business school, etc., will not be saying that you have to do this, you can't do that, etc. Automatically, this resource allocation will happen. Today, we are going to introduce three concepts: competition and rationality, and how profit-maximizing firms come to it. So, formally, today's class starts uh, from Stiglitz and Walsh pages number 25 and 29. So in the text file that we saw, let me see this text file, text file again. You can write it down on a piece of paper if you like. So in topic one, we will be looking at these four things. A, how do we define competition? B, what do we mean by rationality? And why do we need it? Three, what is price-taking behavior? Four, why is perfect competition or pure competition a benchmark? Some uh, texts call it pure competition, some call, texts call it perfect competition. So I repeat myself again. What is competition? How do we define it in economics? What is rationality? Why do we need it? If we don't have it, what problem will arise? What is price taking behavior? And why do we use perfect or pure competition as a benchmark? Now we go back to the slides again. Can you see the slides? 
Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, lovely. Now, competition. Yes, okay, beautiful. Competition in economics. We define it as how much market share does a single firm hub have in the total transactions? Or how much market share does a single buyer have in all the transactions? We are looking at firms as sellers. So we are looking at how much output does a, a single firm command in the total market share? This is what competition is defined as. Now, if you listen to the video, in the video, I gave an example of our four national operators in our mobile telecom. One was uh, first, uh, I'm do, giving them uh, according to size, Ramin phone. Then we have uh, Roby. Number three, we have Bangalink. Number four, we have our national operator, Teletalk. Now, these four dominate the entire uh, uh, mobile, phone, mobile phone network. Ramin phone's market share is say 33%. What does that mean? If there are 100 calls made every day, Ramin phone uh, operators uh, 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 are responsible for 33 of them. Now, if it was like this, that the four farms have 25% of the market share, is this a situation of the market being competitive? Let me repeat myself. If yes, the four farms, Gramin Phone, uh, Roby, Bangla Link, and uh, our Teletop, each one has 25% of the market share. Isn't it a competitive market? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So yes, competition, sir, competitive has competitive. nothing to do with the number of producers. The producers can be even two producers. For example, say Pepsi company and Coca-Cola company, where each one of them has a market share of 50%. So we will, see, uh, so we will see in this case that although there are only two producers, the ma ma uh, uh, market is highly competitive. This is one way of de defining competition, but in economics, we start off with a benchmark of perfect or pure competition. Perfect or pure competition means each seller has 0% of market share. Not exactly zero, but very close to zero. Okay, let me give you a practical example from Dhaka city. When we walk around in Dhaka city, two things are the most common things that are sold. Number one are bananas. Number two is eggs. Do you agree with me? When you walk around in the uh, uh, say, town, uh, in, in the streets. Yes, uh, sir. The most yes, sir. common thing that is sold in Dhaka city are eggs. And banana. And bananas. Sorry. Uh, 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 bananas are here. Yeah, eggs for them. So how many sellers are there who sell bananas? Hundreds and thousands. How many sellers are there who sell eggs? Hundreds and thousands. Okay. Now, the issue here is if there are two, 20 million people in Dhaka city, if even one out of two has one egg every day, how many eggs are transacted in Dhaka city every day? 10 million. Isn't this a big market? Yes, sir. It's a big market. It's a very big market. Officially, we say that two crore people live in Dhaka city. So that's 20 million. So even if half of them has one egg every day, there are 10 million eggs, one crore eggs that are transacted every day. It's a huge market, but a single seller, uh, how much of the market share does a single seller have? Isn't it almost near to zero? Yes, sir. Very insignificant. Very insignificant. So if a single seller tomorrow de de decides, I'll sell uh, 500 more eggs, that will not affect the uh, market of eggs in Dhaka city. If that single seller decides no tomorrow, I will not sell at all. Even that will not affect the entire eggs, eggs or the banana market of Dhaka city. You can ask a question, why do we need uh, uh, zero market share in our model? We'll answer this question in a little while. 
So you can write down on a piece of paper right now why we need zero market share. The second assumption that we said was rationality. Rationality means nothing but choosing the best from a set of alternatives. If we are maximizing something, if we are minimizing something, then we try to choose the worst from a set of alternatives. So rational behavior is basically choosing an extreme. If we are maximizing something that we like, we will try to choose the best. If we are minimizing something that we don't like, for example, households want to minimize expenditure, firms want to minimize costs, then we choose the minimum point, which is the worst point. Now, why do we need rational behavior? Can somebody uh, may, uh, guess or uh, think why we need rational behavior? Or why are we obsessed with rational behavior? Can so that we can minimize opportunity cost? No. The thing is, if we don't, this is how we look at it. What will happen if uh, the decision makers are not rational? Number one, they are not choosing the best if it is a maximizing problem. If they are not choosing the best, that means they are not making the, be uh, the best outcome of the environment they're finding themselves in. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. So our model will not be complete. If people are rational, then we don't have a problem. Uh, we are choosing the best or the worst if it's a minimum problem. And wherever all the households or all the firms end up, that will be the best possible outcome, given the environment that everybody finds themselves in. So if people are not rational decision makers, they are not choosing the best. So there's a gap. This was the best outcome that was possible. This is the outcome that is happening. So it is a bad equilibrium. For now, we are interested in good equilibrium. Good equilibria is a situation where everybody ends up uh, doing the best. Okay? Got it? Yes, okay, sir. Now, okay, sir. Just before we started rationality, I, I actually we should have covered this. My slide sequencing is wrong. That is, why do we uh, assume zero market share? If, our, if my total market share, no matter how much I sell or how less I sell, cannot influence the price of eggs or bananas in Dhaka city, how will the price of bananas in Dhaka city uh, be determined? Our total sales, the deem our banana ke influence for the Napare, then Dhaka Shore deem our banana price keep away determined for it. Supply, madam, sir. Uh, supply, uh, what supply? Supply of all the sellers. Yes, sir. What demand? Demand of all the, the buyers. Yes. So, all the buyers, I'm sorry. Yes, you're correct. All the buyers. That means my individual behavior as a seller cannot influence the price at which each unit of eggs or bananas will be sold. This is called price taking behavior. If my market share is in, uh, very, very small, so small that I can't influence the total outcome of the market, then as a seller, I'm a price taker. I take each unit of price to be fixed. Based on that, I determine how much I'm going to produce. That determine, that, that will de depend on various factors, but do you get the logic now? That if our market share is zero, we cannot influence the price. No single buyer or seller can influence price. If no single buyer or seller can influence price, then that means that the market price will be determined by supply and demand, like one of our friends just said, and that price will be fixed. Is that clear? Yes, sir. So if you look at this part of the slide, and this is slide number four on the second panel, it's written here clearly that when firms have zero market share, there are many firms naturally selling the same item. Price is determined on market supply. This concept we will be coming back again once we get into further uh, details. 
and uh, what's the next thing? Okay, so we uh, we come to the end of topic one. As for topic one, these are the questions that we should be able to answer. Why does the basic competitive model assume rational consumers? We just uh, uh, said it right now. If the decision makers are not rational, the total market outcome will not be the best outcome. If farms are not profit maximizing, then they're doing, doing something wrong. Why are farms and buyers price takers under perfect competition or pure competition? Because they cannot influence the price of the market as a single buyer or seller. We just asked these two questions. Uh, uh, the first two questions, the way they have been framed, if we uh, start well, like this, that, okay, what will happen if uh, uh, decision makers are not rational? What will happen if farms are not price takers? Then we can answer these two questions very quickly, very easily. And uh, as we proceed, we'll find that uh, economics is very much of uh, common sense. Okay, before we go to topic two, is there anything that somebody would, would like to discuss on in topic one? Or shall we proceed to towards topic two? Topic two, the Agabo? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. So let's get back yes, to Oh, somebody's tapping. Oh, I see. I see. Now, where's the share screen? Ah. Okay, in topic two, these are the two uh, things that we are going to try to address. What do we mean by incentives? Incentives are clearly defined as these, these three things, prices, profits, and property rights. So what we are going to look at is what will, uh, how do these three uh, indicators or how do these three variables influence our incentives? And this is written in the uh, text. So we have to, uh, uh, go through it, but why do incentives ultimately lead to inequality? This is what we'll look at uh, with a small a small example. We go back to the slides again. Okay, this is it, huh? Okay, so incentives is that we find ourselves in an environment and in this environment, we may be encouraged to do something. The opposite is also true, the complement said. We may be discouraged to do something. So in our model, the encouragement or the discouragement, whatever, uh, whichever way you look at it, is indicated by three variables. Number one is prices. Number two is profits for the firms. Number three is property rights. Common sense tells us if the price of something goes up, sellers are happy, but buyers are not happy. So sellers find themselves in one kind of environment, environment again, we're repeating the term, and they start to supply a lot. They start their, uh, they increase their production because the price of something is going up. Households uh, operate in the opposite direction. When the price of something go, uh, goes up, their demand for that particular uh, item starts to go down, so they reduce their spending because they find themselves in an environment that is discouraging their normal activities. What is profits? Profits is a signal to the firms where capital will flow. If firms find out that in a particular economic activity, profit is very high, all the firms will uh, flock towards that particular point. That means capital will flow to the point uh, to the area where profits are very high. What is property rights? Property rights, on the name, it suggests that it gives us the entitlement to own something under certain conditions. It also gives us the entitlement to sell something under uh, uh, what do you call it? Some uh, uh, for proper some terms and conditions. Now, if property rights don't exist in a market, I think we discussed this a little bit last week, then there will be total chaos in the society. Do we agree with this? 
Yes, sir. Yes, sir. To transact a, 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 a service or a good, whatever it is, the buyer and the seller have to know the terms and conditions. If these terms and conditions is not given properly or not respected, then what will happen? There will be chaos. Why? Somebody who is very powerful will, uh, will be able to enjoy whatever, uh, what, whatever is available. So what impact will that have? Those who are buyers, they will not have an incentive to buy. The reverse is also true. Those who are sellers, they also will not have an incentive to sell the particular product. You get it? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. This is all common sense. Okay. So, and then now let's revisit. Prices is nothing but signals what goods are scarce or in abundance. So consumers adjust by, uh, uh, respond by adjusting their consumption. Firms respond to prices knowing which goods consumers value more. See, uh, profits is nothing but a signal to firms to determine how and where to allocate the resources and technology. Property rights, just as, as I said. So then the last question that we want to address here is, if, there are, if property rights are not well defined, then there is a, a phrase in Bangla. I, I don't know if our foreign friends are here. But uh, the ba ba Bangladeshi friends will understand. Jorjar Mulluktar. Have you heard this phrase? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And uh, yes, sir. For, uh, everywhere. Uh, everywhere. Huh? And uh, if, uh, for our non Bangladeshi friends, this Eng the English is might is right. So if might is right becomes the order of markets, then who, people who are not who are not mighty don't have an incentive to create wealth. So there has to be clearly defined property rights. And this thing is, this thing happens over time. Now in your class, in the two sections, there's I think round about almost 120 students. Now, if somebody deserves 3.9, they will definitely get 3.9 out of four or even four out of four. If somebody de deserves three or less, they will get the three or less. Is this fair? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. If if you get a signal that uh, if you work hard, uh, you will not get a high grade, then what will happen? You will not have an incentive to uh, work hard in this course. Okay. So, uh, but if you uh, know that the system is fair, if I work hard, and if uh, the questions, are, if I'm lucky with the questions, then I'll get a good grade. So those who have worked hard, uh, uh, according to the fair system, they get a high grade. Those who have not worked hard will get a low grade. Perfectly uh, uh, fair at this point of time. Now, this competition uh, uh, is carrying on for another generation. What's happening? Those who got 3.9 out of four, or even four out of four, they get a fantastic opportunity in, in, in life. Those who did not get three, uh, uh, three uh, the high grade, say they got three out of four, they do not enjoy opportunities in life. What happens over time? The children of those who are 3.9, they get further opportunities because they, they are children of 3.9 uh, uh, CGPA students. The children of three uh, uh, CGPA students get less opportunity. What will happen over time? Won't the society slowly become unfair? Children of three. Yes, sir. Because the, the uh, parents uh, did very well in university, they, they, they got access to lots of opportunities. Children of students who are uh, three, because their parents didn't do well, they did not get access to so many opportunities. So over time, what happens in the next generation? This is a fair system. We've all agreed. But this can lead to inequality. Competition is good in the short run. Competition over time, if not managed properly by the society, can end up into very, very unequal societies. Do you understand this situation? See, markets automatically create uh, yes, sir. Uh, uh, inequality over time. Every society is unequal. But if the inequality becomes intolerable, unacceptable, that becomes an unfair society. But this is an issue 
that we uh, uh, that should be addressed uh, ethically and moral challenges for society etc so at the end of topic 2 these are the three questions that we would like to answer or at least understand what to do marketing in market economics question number 3 individuals and firms receive incentives through prices profits and property rights very simple you just give, give an example and uh, it's finished question number 4 Why is there a trade-off between incentive and equality over uh, uh, for market economies over time? This is something that you need to think about. What would you suggest to remedy the situation? Okay, this is a, a, a food for thought. And what will happen when property rights fail? This is for optional study, but from common sense we can tell that if property rights fail, then there will be chaos. and there will be no incentive for creating wealth so we are and uh, uh, we we'll come to the end of topic 2 is there any question anybody would like to ask regarding topic 2 karo kono question ache does anybody have questions regarding topic 2 or shall we proceed Hello, sir. I can hear you properly, sir. Oh dear. Ah, uh, can you hear me now? Yes, sir. No, sir. There is no question. No, there is no question. But the person who is not hearing me, can you hear me now? Loud and clear, sir. Ah, so you are hearing me. But the person who didn't hear me a little while ago, can you hear me uh, now? I think, sir, he is having a problem in his end. Okay, you. Ah, uh, you do one thing. You try to ah uh, uh, re-log. uh leave the meeting and uh, log in again yes sir perfectly sir ah that th that should be good or uh, if you are using a mobile uh, computer you restart your computer okay so shall we proceed to topic number 3 yes sir okay, okay. now oh, oh i didn't write topic number 3 so uh, okay so far we have used price as a signal to allocate resources so if prices are high you know supply goes up demand goes down prices are low supply goes down demand goes up there are alternative ways to discuss uh, what do you call it uh, uh, resource allocation let me write it down over here i forgot to write it okay so Let me write it down. So we have viewing rations. Okay. So if prices don't work, in many in many societies prices may not work for whatever reason. Then there's three options. We can use queuing. We can use rations. we can use lotteries this is what we will look at now and in fact this is very practical also let's get back acha what is queuing you will stand in a line thik hai sir have you been to the airport has anybody traveled yes sir yes sir okay when you go to check in your uh, luggage in the airport you find two queue, uh, two lines one line is for economy passengers one line is for business class or other uh, most valued uh, uh, people right huh right sir yes okay. sir yes sir now the person who uh, is in business class that person is paying a higher price to be in that business class queue the person who is in the economy class cannot pay that higher price okay but the person who is in the uh, business class because he is paying a higher price by paying a higher price he is showing that he for him time is money he might have a, a, a meeting at the last moment so coming to the airport for him is very difficult 3 hours in advance so he want he wants to be in the uh, queue where there is no traffic now if i am an uh, economy class uh, uh, passenger and i travel once every 2 years 
I can afford the luxury of waiting for uh, half an hour before my luggage is checked in. So I pay a lower price. By this, what happens is those who are in high demand, they pay a higher price because they, uh, their demand for the uh, particular service is high. Those who are in lower demand stand in a different queue. So by queuing, making people to wait, we can uh, separate the market. We can segregate the market into different components. Now, for example, who has more demand gets the service quickly, who has less demand and can afford to wait gets the service later. Now, let me give you another example. Uh, how many of you uh, buy uh, Sony uh, uh, PlayStation, the latest mobile or even the latest uh, iPhone as soon as it comes out? Is there anyone in the class? Who bought, uh, who bought the latest mobile as the moment it came out? Uh, sir, uh, don't know about the consoles or the devices. I waited for a graphics card. Okay, so, lovely. Yes, sir. And, and so, and uh, carry on. Yes, sir. So uh, at first it was rated uh, about $300 on the opening day. Okay. And the stocks were out. So uh -huh. Uh, those who bought that day, it was 300, but after one month, uh, not one month, uh, 20 to 25 days, okay. the prices were lower by 50 to $60. Okay, lovely. And when did you buy? So, when the price was 300 or when the price uh, Sir, was I waited for the price cut. I knew it's going to go down. Okay, you waited for the pri uh, price to go down because your demand for that graphics card was not that high. Yes, you exactly. Not, uh, you were not that... Uh, you, uh, uh, Okay, let me give you another example. When uh, Apple launches a mobile or Samsung launches their latest mobile or Xiaomi launches the latest flagship mobile, don't they give pre-order? Yes, sir. Why do they give pre-order? Yes. Because for the they want to identify those customers for whom the demand for, for the, uh, of the product is very high. Now, like our clever friend who waited one month he knew that the prices would go down. Those who are making pre-order, don't they know that the price will go down after one month or two months? Yes, they, they, they do know, know sir. They, they definitely but they want the product as fast as possible. They want, they want the product, they're willing to pay a higher price, so they're willing to uh, enter the business class. Those who can afford to wait so one, week, one, one month, two months, they enter the economic class, they get it later. So by queuing, Okay, waiting in a line before the product or after the product launch, resource can be allo allocated. Another way of using uh, resource allocation bypassing the price mechanism is lotteries. Lottery will come key booty actually. We buy a ticket and then uh, maybe it's uh, the 10 lakh taka is the top price. One person wins the lottery, right? All right. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. This, is how, this is the common uh, definition of lottery. Let me give you another definition. For example, Brack University or Brack uh, NGO, they own a lot of land somewhere outside Dhaka. And what they did, they decided that for 50 bigas or uh, 16 acres of land, they're going to a very, very big uh, pond, which will be used for fish, fish, uh, uh, acti fishing activities. What can they, uh, what, uh, what can they do? They can't, can't they sell the, uh, fish, uh, 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 the pond? on a lease to somebody for say 10 years? Yes, sir. They can issue uh, they can, they they can can lease a, a lease, leasing, leasing contract with a, a third party. Okay. Now, when BRAC University does that or BRAC NGO or whatever, then what happens is they can also use lotteries. Lottery is the key that uh, you pay uh, what we call in Bangla, bondo. Are you familiar with the term bondo? When you uh, buy a piece of land, Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Everybody pays a, a, a money to enter the club, but only one or two people will get the piece of land. Just like one or two people will get that uh, pond. This is another form of lottery. And this form of lottery is very common in our uh, everyday life. If you want to buy a plot in Pugachol, maybe there are 300 plots, but how many people gave money to buy a plot? 3,000, 30,000, even 3 lakhs. 
they pay up front but there was no guarantee that they will get the piece of land right yeah yes so sir. this is another yes, kind sir. of property. they were say 3000 plots of land in purachal but if you uh, look at their uh, accounts not less than 30000 or even 300000 people applied for a piece of land but not none of them got it not not all of them got it sorry only that a certain amount of people got it sir is it like an auction no no this is not an auction okay this is not an auction is a different way of doing it okay and another thing another way that we can uh, allocate resources is by coupons for example your university can give everybody a coupon for a token that every month you can do 50 copies or 100 copies of printing free in the uh, computer lab you have something uh, some system like this yes sir yes, we do we have do. Okay, so how many uh, copies do you get free? Two hundred copies. Yes, sir. Two hundred copies. So, but they won't give me that coupon. They give that coupon to you because you are a student there, right? Hmm. Uh, they, uh, so, because you are a student, you get two hundred copies free per month or whatever per semester. I don't get that advantage because I don't belong to your class. Societies used. uh in the 70s and also some well part into the 1980s there was uh, there was a concept for ration cards in bangladesh it was a blue book so if i had a blue book i would get a certain amount of rice sugar and other uh, essentials okay but if i was very very rich in the society i did, i was i did not qualify for a ration card so this is another way of bypassing the price system and uh, allocating resources so one thing i'm going to uh, give maybe this uh, week or next week uh, that is you develop a model using queues with a practical example using lot uh, lotteries uh, with a practical example using coupons with a practical example for example this is the learning outcome this does alternatives to the price system there's three alternatives and there was another uh, another alternative somebody mentioned auctions right who mentioned the uh, the, uh, the uh, auctions ekjon uh, ekjon mentioned korechilo okay that person is not here now so if you can uh, these these are the three methods that are uh, mentioned in your text if you can come up with another uh, one no problem Is sir if i may uh, interrupt ashu sure, please sir auction is another kind of queuing right i'm another paying kind of? more another kind of queuing queues like i'm paying more if i can pay more i get the thing right yes but auctions can also be when the lowest person will buy the bid okay there are th there are not numerous types of auctions but what happens is uh we are bypassing the price mechanism yeah the price of the product is not determined through supply and demand right in auctions yes the same argument holds for rationing by coupons rationing by lotteries and rationing by queues the, uh, the price of the product is not determined through supply and demand okay okay and uh, we'll uh, I, i i have a target to uh, cover auctions when we cover auctions so hopefully then we'll be able to uh, discuss in detail now who is afraid of mathematics i think quite a few of you admitted last week that you are afraid of mathematics right yes sir yes, sir very good at least we have quite some honest, uh, we have some people who give honest answers okay so mathematics the, 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 we don't have to worry too much there's only two con concepts that we want to learn number one how to read a graph so the lady who said uh, yes uh, do you, uh, do you remember how to re read a graph x axis y axis yes sir i know i very good so you see you uh, you're already confident yes sir okay and uh, you know how to uh, interpret a ratio the entire class yes sir good so if you can uh, uh, interpret a graph that means what's x axis what's y axis if you can interpret a ratio you have done more than 70% of mathematics that we need and these are basically high school mathematics okay so 
I don't need. Do I need to go into details what a graph is? No, sir. I don't. Graph is just a two-dimensional uh, expression. We have a horizontal axis, and uh, biologically, we are programmed to uh, read left to right as positive, right to left as negative, and we have a vertical axis. And biologically or evolutionarily, we we are programmed to write read bottom to up as positive, up to bottom as negative. That's it. And uh, uh, do we need to know uh, what an origin is? Do we need to know what an origin is? No, sir. No, sir. Origin is just a point of reference from which we measure the this coordinate where which is plus plus, this coordinate which is minus plus, this coordinate which is minus minus, and over here they haven't showed it. And we have four quadrants, but in economics. We will focus only on the first quadrant. Why? Positive. Yes. Why? Because if our variable is price, price may decrease, but price will never be negative in quantity. If our variable is output produced, output produced may decrease, but output produced will never be less than zero. In economics, we don't observe. Uh, we almost never. We never observe negative quant uh, 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 variables or quantities. That's why our entire focus will be on the first quadrant, where x is always positive because it's a horizontal rightward movement. Y, whatever the variable is, is always positive because it's a vertical upward movement. So we will focus only on the first quadrant. Does anybody have any problem with this table? No, sir. On left uh, column we have dvds right column we have cds so we can show the amount of dvds on one axis we can show the amount of cds on another axis over here keep it set okay dvds are shown on the x axis so they are moving from 0 to 6 0 to 6 and cds are uh, shown on the uh, y axis so they are moving upwards from 0 to 12 but look over here can everybody find a specific ratio? If I sacrifice one DVD, how many CDs can I always get? Two CDs, sir. Does everybody agree? If I sacrifice one DVD, how many extra CDs can I get always? Two, two CDs, two. sir. So that the ratio is two. One is to that two. is the slope. One is to two. One is to two or two is to one, whichever way you look at it, okay? Yes. So the slope is. No, I didn't understand. Much. Okay, you don't understand. Very good. We'll try again. Hello. Just a second. Okay, if we move, uh, suppose uh, I spend my entire budget, which is 120 in this particular exam example, and I buy six DVDs. That means I cannot buy any CDs with my budget. Now, the next thing is, if I buy one DVD less. How many CDs can I get? Is this is this okay? If I sacrifice one DVD, will I get two extra uh, CDs? Yes, sir. Extra? Okay, good. Then, if I sacrifice another DVD, how many extra uh, CDs can I get? Plus two. If I sacrifice another DVD. How many uh, extra CDs can I get? Two. Two. So the ratio of exchange, even if this is in dollars or taka or any other uh, 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 currency, if I sacrifice one DVD, I get two CDs. This is constant for all the units. The reverse is true. If I sacrifice one CD, sorry, if I sacrifice one CD, I get half a DVD. That means I have to sacrifice two CDs to get one DVD. I have to sacrifice four CDs to get two DVDs. The person who said that you don't understand, is it a little bit clear now? Uh, yes, sir, it's clear now. Okay, okay, good. Then basically slope is nothing but a ratio. That means if I gain one DVD plus one, divided by minus two, whatever, okay? Now, 
Uh oh, it's gone again. Just a second. Okay, we have to go back again. Where were we? Okay, we're here. Okay, now let us see this thing in a graph. CDs are on the y axis 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12. 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12. DVDs are on the x axis. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Now we are going to move from point A to point E. Okay, so at point A, what do we have? Can we do objective set? Sorry, objective, no, sorry, the measurement. Sorry, is this somebody say something? Actually, this part of the action. Oh, so you're talking to somebody else. Okay. At point A. Sorry, we... sir. No, no, no problem. Uh, at point A, we have eight CDs and two DVDs. We are going to move to point E. If we move to point E, we sacrifice two CDs, gain one DVD. Is that clear? At point A, we have eight CDs, two DVDs. We are moving from point A to point E. We sacrifice two CDs. For one DVD, right? Yes, sir. Achha. Slope is nothing but the ratio between rise and run. Rise means you're going up and down, so that's the vertical axis. Run means you're moving horizontally. You never run uh, vertically, so that is the x x axis change. So what happens? We started off with two DVDs at A, ended up with three DVDs at E. So the change is last observed uh, unit minus first observed unit, three minus two. We started off with eight CDs, ended up with six. So the difference is six minus eight. Is that clear with everybody? Yes, sir. Good. Mm -hmm. And the best way, if you for, forgot this basic uh, mathematics from high school because you haven't practiced for a long time, it's nothing but a ratio between rise and run. The, if you uh, use the word rise, we are automatically talking about a vertical movement. That means a change in the y-axis. If we use the word run, we are definitely talking about a horizontal movement because we run horizontally. So that is the run. So as we move from A to E, the ratio is minus two. Minus two, the minus is just the sign that if we gain something, we lose something. That is, uh, that's why it's minus, but the ratio is two. That means for each DVD, two CDs can be bought, etc. Now, those who are very good at mathematics or at least confident with this, we know that in mathematics, x is always the independent variable. Who remembers this? Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. And by definition, y is always the dependent variable, right? Yes, right. sir. Dependent on x. Okay. Now, in economics, we might be changing this convention. Alfred Marshall uh, was, was an economist in the 19th century and early 20th century. He put price, the independent variable, on the vertical axis. This is known as Marshall's convention. What happens to, because of that is that everything goes upside down. That's it. So those. But who, that's just a graphical representation, right? Sorry. The independent vari variable remains independent. Independent um, remain always independent. Yes. Just and how he showed it graphically. Yeah, correct. Correct. Perfectly correct. So that's a convention that we need to keep in mind because uh, if, if anyone of us in this class has never done economics, but has done mathematics, automatically we will go to autopilot by saying that X is the independent variable, Y is the dependent variable. In economics, we are going to uh, reverse it sometimes. We, have, we won't be doing it now, but we will be later. So you just keep this thing in mind 
economics convention may change. Okay, then as uh, this is the uh, we, we know this and we know this, we don't need to go over this. Achha. Does anybody have any problem that this is a positive slope? No, sir. Does anybody have any problem that this is a positive slope? No, sir. No, Achha, sir. Uh, uh, no, sir. Started, I'll still repeat. Somebody might be shy to admit. Positive means if x increases, y also increases. If x decreases, y also decreases. So if we move from this quad, uh, coordinate to this coordinate, what is happening? X or y, isn't both x and y increasing? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So it's positive. If we do the opposite movement from uh, this coordinate to this coordinate, the value of x and y are both decreasing. OK? Okay, this, is, this is a negative slope. That means if x increases, y decreases. Mm. Or vice versa, if x decreases, y increases. So if we move from 1, 2 to 3, 0, we see that x increases, y decreases. Negative slope. If we move from 3, 0 to 1, 2, we see that x decreases, y increases. This is negative slope. 0 over here means there is no change in y. Same. No matter how much x uh, increases from 1 to 3, the value of y remains unchanged. Undefined means infinity, but uh, graphically that means the value of x remains unchanged. Now I'm going to go to a mathematical convention. If anybody has any problem, just tell me. Here the slope is 0. Why? Because this is horizontal to the independent axis. In this case, the slope is undefined or infinity. Why? Because this is, this is vertical to the independent axis. Do so we all agree on this statement? The slope here is zero because the line is horizontal to the independent axis. The slope here is infinity because it is vertical to the independent axis, which is the horizontal axis. Do we all agree? Do we all agree on this one? Okay. Now let's get back to this. If Y is the independent axis, then this line becomes vertical to the independent axis. Do you see this visually? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. If Y yes. is the independent axis, then this line becomes vertical to the independent axis, right? Then the slope becomes infinity. Okay. This is what we will see in economics when we would price over here. If x is the independent axis, this is vertical to the x axis. But zero. if y is the independent axis, then isn't it horizontal to the independent axis? Yes, sir. If y is the independent yes, axis, sir. this straight line is horizontal to the independent axis, in that case, the slope will become zero. This is the only ups and downs that we will be in uh, Hakkata Acha, Does anybody remember that the slope of a straight line is always the same as we move from one point to another? Yes, sir. Why? Because the inclination of the curve remains unchanged. Yeah. Isn't the inclination at E different from the inclination at A? Yes. Yes, yes sir. Yes, sir. Why is it so? Look at the inclination, inclination over here and look at the inclination over here. Which one is more steep? At A. E or at A? A. Yes, sir. Does everybody agree that it's more steep at A? The question yes, yes, is sir. The slope, what is, uh, uh, where is it more steep? At point E or at point A? A, point sir. A sir. Does point everybody, A, sir. Everybody agrees at A, right? Yeah. Yes, sir. Now, if I reframe the question like this, that 
why is the independent axis won't your results go become upside down for uh, y being the independent yeah if y is the independent everybody is saying that a is more steep because we are looking at a in reference to the x axis right but if we look at a and b in reference to the y axis ঠিক আছে একটু আগে আমরা যেটা বলছি যেটা something uh, the slope was zero but if we look at y is the independent axis it becomes infinity the slope which is infinity with x as, as the independent axis becomes zero when y is the independent axis so ekhon using that same argument if i say that you know y is the independent axis so like, can you visualize which one is more steep at point a or at point e e sir maybe maybe na that it will be e. look at it very clearly if y is the independent axis e is more uh, steep isn't a a little bit flatter let me do another one at here it's more flat it's a little bit steep it's a little bit steeper over here if this is the independent axis yes sir yes sir okay so this is what i wanted to show or tell that depending which axis is the independent axis in our reference the slopes will become upside down and which is sir acha theek hai bujhna hai no problem look at this one is the slope zero sir guns and butter chill so we will decide is the slope zero the person who said bujhna hai is the slope zero yes sir why because we are looking at x uh, in reference to x if we look at in reference to y then isn't it 90 degree over here yes sir so that it, then the slope will become infinity is this 90 degree over here if, uh, if x is our reference axis no sir is this line 90 degree to the x axis oh yes sir yes sir yes sir, if, yes, sir. is this line 90 degree to the y axis or 0 degree to the y axis Zero degree to the y. Zero to y. Finally, in uh, uh, in this one, if x is the reference axis, slope is infinity. If x is the sorry, y is the reference what? axis, slope is zero. Yes, sir. In this one, if x is the independent axis, slope is zero. If y is the independent axis, slope is infinity. Got it now? The person who said Bujine. Yes, sir. Good. You 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 just read this again. Uh, these are high school things uh, maybe because of less practice you forgot but uh, if you look at it again and again let's go now before we move on to topic 4 uh, does anybody have any problems with what we uh, discussed so far in topic 3 so that we can move on to topic 4 Does anybody have any problem or regarding topic three or maybe if you look at it again, you it will be clear. Right? Oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, lovely. Yes, These things we have already discussed in uh, uh, two uh, last week, but now we are going to discuss it in a little uh, more detail. Opportunity set is just two words. With these two words, if we make a sentence, the set of opportunities. if we use the word uh, definition as set of opportunities there's a there's a uh, the counter thing is what is not an opportunity what is not possible for us so when we say an opportunity uh, set in this set this is possible outside this set the, uh, it is not possible given the environment that the decision makers find themselves in what is the environment given the prices of the goods if it is a household given the income of the uh, family in a particular time and finally the time constraint so if these things change the price the income the time framework under which we are analyzing it now the decision making change hoye jabe na won't our decision making change as well yes sir if the time is small we respond in a different way in one way sorry If the time uh, uh, span becomes longer, we respond in another way. Doesn't, uh, Taina? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, 
that's the environment that we find ourselves in. If the change is favorable, graphically, the whole opportunity cost will move out, shift out of it. If the uh, change is not favorable, graphically, the whole opportunity set will shift inwards. Can you visualize this? Your situation is improving. Isn't your opportunity set also improving? Look at my hands. Yes. Your situation is improving. Either prices fail, your income increase, etc. Government uh, 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 released some taxes on the goods, so the prices fell. So the opportunity set is shifting outwards. Our budget constraint is nothing but the income of the household. Time constraint is yellow. And, and we were discussing uh, the model. The model was very simple. Our uh, income was fixed at 120. And uh, we could buy a certain amount of DVDs and CDs. Is point F possible to attain? Is point F possible to attain? Even no, sir. Uh, no, sir. Point F. It's not possible. Not in the opportunity. Sir. No. If we want to attain point F, then the prices of the goods have to fall or our income has to increase. F is not possible. But E and D are possible. Okay? Yes, now, sir. If somebody decides to uh, 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 allocate their budget at D, Another person decides to allocate their budget at E. What is the difference between the two? The person who decides to allocate their budget at D has not utilized their total budget. Does everybody agree? Yeah, I agree. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. That means the, yes. the, the person who decides to uh, allocate their budget at point D has some savings. Now, that's not mm -hmm. a problem. So, uh, we don't uh, spend our entire budget, but our time framework is valid for only one time period. So in this time period, if we have savings, what do we do with it? We can't pass it on to the next time period. Now, if our analysis was more than one time period, we could definitely go to F. How? We could take a loan and then go to F. We do that all the time, don't we? Don't we take loans? Don't we swipe our credit cards? We do. Because we know that our next time period exists. But in our model, we are assuming that the next time period does not exist. So if we decide to stay within the opportunity set, we are not doing the best that we can, given the environment that we find ourselves in. The best that we can is to be just what is possible. That means on the boundary. And B1 and B2, these are uh, extreme points these are known as the intercept points, where we spend everything for uh, DVDs over here at B1, everything for CDs on B2. So what is not possible? F. What is possible but not desirable? D. Do we, uh, does everybody get the logic why D is possible but not desirable? Yes, sir. Yes, yes sir. Because, because of the time frame, sir, right? Yeah, because we have savings, but we have more, but since our analysis is valid for only one time period, it won't be a, a clever thing to do. So our best option is point E. Okay. This is production possibilities frontier. Same thing again, guns and butters. Uh, butter on x-axis, guns on y-axis. And this curve is not a straight line, unlike the budget constraint that we looked at over here. This is also an opportunity set, but the boundary is not straight line. That means slope at C, slope at B, slope at A, these slopes will be different from each other. Because we have all agreed that slopes will be different on, on a curved line. Okay. Now, our reference axis is X. Look at B and look at A. Which slope is steeper? 
Our reference axis is x. Do we observe a steep slope at point A, at point B, or point C? Point, point A. A, sir. A. Acha. We move from point C to point B to gain certain amount of butter. We sacrifice certain amount of plants. Then we decide, no, we want more butter. We want more civilian goods. We are not in a war, so we don't need military goods. We move from point B to point A. Isn't the ratio more difficult? Ratio the better option. Acha. Can can somebody think from common sense why this is happening? Can somebody think from common sense why this is happening? If you do, if you can't, I'll answer. Don't worry. Ita karo mata khelse. Why is it that if we produce more and more butter, it is difficult to sacrifice more and more guns? Sir, because of the law of diminishing utility. Yeah, uh, uh, that means you've done some economics before. Am I correct? Yes, sir. Okay, so you you don't answer. Okay. Those those <laughs> of you who those of you who haven't done economics. Why do you think, from common sense, that the more butter that we produce, it becomes difficult to sacrifice more and more guns? Those who have not done economics before, unlike our uh, our lady friend right now. If you if you if you say you don't know, I'll answer the question with a very common sense uh, logic. Okay, I'll answer. Sir, at one point the demand decreases. No, no, no. For the butter. No, no, no. Uh, sir, because uh, I think we have a limited set of budget. So if we spend all this in butter, then uh, no, 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 no. That was this argument was applicable for this one. This example. Okay. Okay. Let's start with point F. What do we have at point F? The society is producing all guns. And no butter. Guns is just a metaphor for military goods. Butter is a metaphor for civilian goods. This example was done by Paul Samuelson during the Cold War, so that's why uh, there are guns and butters. Acha, if the if the society wants to produce some butter and go to point C, what will the so society do? It will bring the most efficient labor force from the guns industry and make them start producing butter. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. If we are at point S, we are producing all guns and no butter, and then we wake up and find out no, that's not good. We need to produce some butter, so we move from F to C. So what do we do? We take the most efficient labor in the guns producing industry, who also have this expertise to produce butter, and then we go to point C. Then we find out that we want more butter. We want to move to point B. The next lot. That we bring from the guns industry, will they be as productive as the first lot? No. So definitely, we will get less uh, butter than we did uh, uh, from F to C. If we decide to produce more butter, then what will happen? Uh, we will uh, to uh, come to point A. We will have to bring the third best uh, set of uh, 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 labors from the guns industry. Or if the other two are more efficient, then won't they be less efficient than the previous two? Less efficient than the previous ones. Yes. That's why the slope is increasing. It becomes the opportunity cost becomes higher for producing butter. So, sir, is it about labor? It's a, it's about labor. It's about efficiency. It's also about uh, it's about uh, efficiency of uh, labor in this particular context. Let let me give you another example. Uh, if your classes are one hour slots, okay, at eight o'clock, are you more productive, or at six six thirty in the evening you are more productive? At six thirty, sir. Six thirty, you are more productive. Then the starting, I think we. I don't know. Starting is in the morning, eight thirty, and six thirty being the evening. Okay. Oh, sorry, if, sir. I didn't get. This. <laughs> sorry. If, if the first class is at eight thirty. And throughout the day, you don't take any rest. Okay, so and all the classes are one-hour slot. Are you more productive at eight thirty or at six thirty? 
the amount of effort you give to understand say 10 units of uh, class at uh, 6.30 within, uh, can you, uh, within that same period, one hour, can you get that uh, 10 hours, of, 10 units of uh, class? At 8.30 in the morning to 9.30, the first class, I make an effort. I, uh, I, uh, I manage to understand 10 units of a course. At 6.30 to 7.30, I give that say, uh, can I give that same effort? No. No, no sir. No, no, that sir. Within that one hour, I cannot get 10 units as I did in the morning. If I can get that 10 units, if that evening class was more than one hour, maybe two hours or three hours. Okay, so the lady who uh, said diminishing returns, she must have done a little bit of economics before. Diminishing returns means something that reduces. So the more and more we continue an activity, the more and more difficult it becomes to be productive as before. This is the diminishing returns. Okay, all right. So if we if we look at it like uh, over here, I've written it down. We produce more and more of wheat on the x-axis. We can produce less and less of corn, less less per unit. Over here we uh, and this arises due to efficiency of inputs in the two sectors. Diminishing returns is a universal phenomenon in all activity given the constraints we face. Now, if somebody says our technology has improved, then we find ourselves in a different environment. If somebody says the prices of the inputs have changed. We find ourselves in a different environment. So given the prices of the inputs here, corn and wheat, given the technology that is fixed for a particular time period, the more and more we uh, uh, pressurize our engine, the less and less the to uh, additional output will be. Okay? All right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. This one we have already discussed, but this we can discuss. If this is your ranking, BRAC, C was another alternative, A was another, D was another. What is the opportunity cost of choosing B? Sacrificing C, C, sir. C. Okay, that's it, okay? And what was yes, sunk cost? Sun cost was? All of the alternatives, sir. Before a uh, decision is made, alternatives were available. After the decision was made, the, uh, the, the alternatives are gone. So they do not uh, influence the new environment that we find ourselves in. This is the sunk cost. And marginal decisions are, uh, how many semesters do you do in this business program, in the masters, this MBA? How many, Sorry, how many semesters do you need to uh, complete an MBA? A minimum six, sir. Six? Five yes, sir. Six, sir. Okay, six. Okay, Five. lovely. So uh, zero to one, one to two, two to three, two to four. Do you finish all these six semesters in one shot or you finish them in uh, one unit after another? One after another. In economic decisions, we do the same thing. We never consume 10 units of glasses of water in one shot. We consume zero to one, one to two, two to three. So when we make a decision to consume an extra unit, we, uh, we observe is this, is this true? If the additional benefit is more than the additional cost, so if this is benefit and this is cost, if you see like this, what do you see? That if I take another uh, semester, this is the additional benefit, this is the additional cost. Aren't you happy? This is the additional benefit, which is uh, heavier. This is the additional cost, which is uh, lighter. Are you happy with this situation? Mm -hmm. Look at me. Huh? Are you happy? Yes, sir. Maybe. That means you uh, go for the next unit. If you see the situation is like this, marginal benefit less than marginal cost, then the marginal benefit is up over here, the additional cost is over here. You have no incentive to go for the next unit. 
if you see that the additional benefit and the additional costs are the same, you are indifferent. You neither want to go for the next unit, you neither want to sacrifice the next unit. This is a situation of eff efficiency or equilibrium. So after this, uh, we come to the end that what is an opportunity to set? Think about in a practical example other than this, what are the constraints? What role do they play in decision making? This second part is for you to think. What will happen if the uh, constraints change? Then we uh, define a PPF, etc., and then we use it for practical decisions. This one we have uh, discussed in uh, week two, so we don't need to discuss now. And marginal costs and marginal benefits we discuss uh, discuss now. Next week. I will look at this one in particular and then start a new topic. If you want, you can read the topic in your uh, text. The opportunity cost of attending college. College doesn't mean HSC or A level. College is the American word for university. So um, what is the opportunity cost of doing a graduate program? Or, or the opportunity cost of doing an MBA at BRAC? And finally, please subscribe to my BRAC U YouTube channel and press the bell icon then you'll get, get updates automatically. And please try to enroll in the Google Classroom. Mr. Azizul, are you here? Mr. Azizul, are you here? Azizul Karim. So maybe he's uh, uh, away now. Uh, well, I, I'll look at him later. So regarding your box problem, somebody was asked, uh, quite a few was asking me, uh, are you still having the problem that the course will start from 2030? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So the course is in live. Yeah. Sorry? The course is in live, sir. I have enrolled. They gave me a link for the course, but uh -huh. it's uh, like uh, hi unhighlighted. You cannot uh, enter it or enroll something like that. Yes, it's I'm okay. also facing the same problem. You, 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 uh, so both of you are facing the same problem that it will start from 2030. 31, yeah. Yes, sir. 30, yes, sir. Okay, 10 years later, huh? But uh, I uh, discussed with the uh, uh, office, with Shotajidda, uh, and uh, I was informed that, uh, what do you call it? It will be updated. So I'll, I, I'll, I'll remind him again that it hasn't been updated. But it doesn't matter. Once, uh, until it is updated, you can get everything from the YouTube channel. You can also get all the reading materials in the Google Classroom. Okay. So we'll uh, uh, focus on these two for the time being. And when Bucks is turned up, then we, uh, Bucks will work again. Okay? So I stop share. Does anybody know? How to uh, sign in Google Classroom? Sorry? What is the link to the Google Classroom? Oh, oh I, I'm not that familiar with all these uh, technicalities. Uh, you do one thing. Uh, you have the email of the ITC uh, uh, classroom er je code ta code ta apni mail e diye rekhechen to ah. ota hocche shobar mail e arekbar jodi diye den notun jara ache ora peye jabe classroom okay, okay. e kiya join classroom diye code ta dile ora join korte parbe okay la bitel and we would we write it down again try to diye den ami pore join korechilam o oh, acha acha just a second classroom code again ami ekhon likhe rakhi na baki i forget I've crossed the age of 50. So nowadays, my brain is just so slowly, you know, diminishing returns. I can't remember everything anymore. So the classroom code again, I'll give for the Google Classroom. And uh, the YouTube channel, you have it already. Okay, I'll, I'll do it again. Does anybody have any questions? Does anybody have any questions? Sir, not right now. I think I have to study first, then ask. Okay, lovely. So what you can do, uh, you can send me an email if you have any questions. You can also write in the Google Classroom. Okay, sir. Okay, if you write in the Google Classroom. Sir, when the box is going to be fixed. Sorry? Sir, when the box, the when, when our box course is going to be fixed. Well, regarding the box, it's a, it's a technical problem at the moment. I'll update with Shoki Okay. Thank you, sir. Until box is updated, we'll, uh, we'll rely on the Google Classroom and the uh, Brack University YouTube uh, videos, okay? 
I'll update. Uh, uh, I'll upload this video. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. So, does anybody have any questions? So shall I? Uh, close yes, this? sir. Do Do we have any Facebook group uh, for this course or? Uh, uh, section two. Open the Facebook group. I don't know whether you guys want to open as well. So we have a common group where both uh, both students of sections are together in a group. I guess. Are all the students in that group, that common group? Uh, uh, yes, sir. Last so. time I checked. We do one thing. Who, um, uh, who told me this uh, information? What's your name? Uh, sorry, sir. Uh, sorry, sir. Not the uh, Facebook group. Facebook group uh, we have for this section. Okay. Uh, for yeah, this section also? Someone, please. For both sections? Uh, section 2, sir. Section 2? Yes, sir. You have a, a specific group only for section 2? Uh, uh, yes, sir. Uh, those of you who have opened a special group only for section two, you email me the link uh, and I'll send it to my I'll send it by email to everybody so that everybody joins that group, okay? Sir, classroom at the email uh, I'll send it, okay? Okay. That's okay. I have already posted the group link. Just a yes. second. Let me uh, uh, copy paste this thing. Okay, you can see. See that page. Okay, let me see whether I can see the group. Okay, this is Eco 501 section dash 2. Back to you and MBA in brackets, right? Yes. Yes, sir. Okay, lovely. What I'll do, I'll, I'll send this link by email and also in the uh, Google Classroom so everybody gets it, okay? Okay, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, okay then, then, then that, that'll be uh, better, I think. Okay, so uh, shall I close the uh, class now? Yes, sir. Okay, yes, then. Sir. So if you have any problems, just uh, knock me in Google Classroom or send me an email, okay? Hello, sir. Okay then. Bye. 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 Bye.